Good morning. Welcome to the OK Grognard Show. It's Wednesday, April 8th, 2020, 10.30 a.m. Central Time in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Today is kind of a new thing. It's uh, something new we're trying. Just D&D campaign discussion. I can talk about my own setting in Grimwald, or we can just talk in general terms, depending on who shows up. And we will see what people have to say, and if they actually make it. Come talk about D&D campaigns. Yep, it's that easy. We'll just... Spread out the word. Throw that in there. Good, we got that. We got to get a couple of links in here. We need the Discord link and the Twitch link, I think. It's either one of those gets people where they need to be. All right. <clears throat> it takes care of that. We'll spread the word a little bit. Talk about D and D campaigns. There we go. Close that down. Mm -mm -mm. And I'll share it in a group. to a page. I don't see why we shouldn't share it the GMing Day page. We're talking about D&D campaigns. Alright. Yeah. Alright. Twitch and Discord both up and running. Let's see if anybody shows up. Uh, I'm in there now. There we go. We'll say hello to the Discord channel if anybody's in there. We're gonna be in there. So, welcome to Grimval Day. Eh? That's this. Oh, hey, want to see something neat? I created a new screen from some artwork to have at the ready in case I have problems. It looks like this. We are experiencing technical difficulty. Please stand by. I've fallen off my ass. Or on my ass. Either way, it works, right? But, uh... <laughs> for those who don't know, I've been playing D&D since... Pretty much since it first got published in 1974. I was a youngster in Waukegan, northern Illinois. And uh, used to go to the wargaming clubs. There were some... ROCT guys on the block that uh, played war games and they kind of recruited some of us younger people to, you know, when I say younger, I mean like 10, 11, 12, to uh, join in. So they had people to play against. Kyle's making fun of my age. They wanted, uh, they just needed more cannon fodder. They needed more opponents, so... Any, anybody that was interested, you know, kids that played chess or other board games were recruited and taught to play these war games. And Then there were clubs, Belvedere Rec Center, uh, eventually Lakehurst. There was a community center out there just outside of Waukegan. And uh, most of them were, well, these ROTC kids went there. The, uh, the population of these things were mostly guys from Great Lakes Naval Training Center and uh, the now defunct Fort Sheridan, which was Lake Forest, Lake Bluff? I think it was Lake Forest, or near there anyway, right? Um, and those guys, those young war gamers who were in the service used to travel up, because it was a train back then, to Lake Geneva to... Uh, 
to game with uh, the war gamers that were up in Lake Geneva. So when D&D first came out in 1974, it was coming back down there to the game clubs down there, and we were taught to play or learned to play quickly and sent away, you know, to uh, to TSR up in Lake Geneva, sent our money to get stuff sent to us. There weren't a lot of hobby game stores back then. Friends Hobby Shop started, I think, late 70s, maybe early 80s. That's still around now. It's actually now in Kenosha and it's been there for a while, but it's one of the longest running game stores. Um, Robert Bigelow is the owner and uh, he can be a real card sometimes. But uh, there's also also the idea that uh, you know we were being taught this game that ostensibly was a war game. It was just a single figures fighting one another in combat. So it was looked at as a an extension of war gaming's back war games back then. It was you know intended to use miniatures. We had played Chainmail before that, so it wasn't a big deal for us to move right over into that. And assume, because, you know, uh, to be honest, anybody looking at early D&D books today uh, would have a tough time making out what to do with them. If you didn't previously play Chainmail and other war games and stuff, some of the terminology probably wouldn't make sense. It'd be a little bit confusing... You might be able to suss it out just based on context and stuff, but, you know, that's what the advantage of being a rpg -er today and looking back at it. But I'm always surprised at the number, or maybe I'm not surprised, at the number of people that I see that are regular role-playing gamers and look back at those books and they're like, this is unplayable. I don't, it doesn't make any sense. And I, I get it. I guess I get it, you know. Um, anyway, they brought it down there in 74, and we started playing, added it into our mix of games with our uh, miniatures, wargaming rules, and our wargame board games that we played, and uh, it became a regular thing, and we played it a lot, and in the summer times when we weren't in school, we'd play it every day, and it was whole heck of a lot of fun. Um, I should also mention, I guess, uh, I don't see anybody in here. Okay, I don't see any of the usual folk in the chat. Maybe they'll join in. We'll see. Kyle's here. Kyle's all we need, right Kyle? As long as Kyle's around, we've got all the, we've got all the fun we need. Kyle, you're a you're a magic player. That's how I guess I know you most from the store through Jesse, and uh, coming out to pre-releases and some other events, and just stopping by. Party has arrived. Yes, sir, you are the party. Um, have you ever played RPGs? You want to jump over into that Discord server and join me on the on the voice chat? Make it a little easier for everyone to enjoy us do a lot less typing that way and we know typing's fun but is it scanning your cards in last night trying to get organized oh yeah so there's the uh, forever job you've got during the unfortunately on a call okay well maybe later or next time um, yeah, I imagine you're not the only one who's reorganizing their magic card collection at this point. I can, Im I can also imagine that everybody's going to have a slightly different way of doing it. You know, at the store, of course, everything is divided by set and just alphabetical by set. If you look at those old books they put in with fat packs... They weren't just 
divvied up that way, they were first divided by color and then alphabetized. And in that way, um, it was maybe easier to build a deck if you're looking for specific things. You didn't have to know the name of a card. You could just flip through. You know, if you're building a Boros deck, flip through all the red and white cards and know what you have. A real shame they stopped making those booklets, huh? Anyway. So I've got something different I'm trying to set up. And maybe I'll set it up now. Is there a way? Yeah, I think that's going to be the way to do it. So, I've got this webcam, and I currently have it pointed sideways at me, and it gets to this wall, which, uh, by the way, is filled with all, course, all sorts of cool stuff. Let me see if I can hmm. I wonder if I can find the image of that. There is an image of all the stuff that's up on that wall that's a little... Oh, I know where it is. It's also on my website. I'll find it over there. But, in the meantime, <clears throat> that is to say, I was thinking about where I need to move this camera if I'm going to be running, running games um, on Roll20 to use some sort of a interface that includes video or maybe just for some of these videos maybe I need to do things a little differently because this the side view as uh, as attractive as I am from the side of course the microphone covers a portion of my grand face but uh, I put up this kind of little D&D comforter I got when it was on sale on Amazon just recently. Recently, I don't know, four or five months ago, really. And decided it would be a cool thing if I used that as a back screen. I thought about getting a green screen, but... Ah, that just seemed like a pain at the time. So what if we're setting this up over here? Hmm. Where does this have to be to to make it make it worthwhile? I guess. Well, here we go. I want to show off some of the artwork I have up on the wall. Unfortunately, my cable for the thing. I'll find a picture. I got a picture I took of it a while ago. But at some point, I'm thinking I want to move this camera. get it set up more like this. We'll see. I don't know. For now, it's over here. I'm going to in a slightly different spot than it was a few minutes ago. Pardon me while I monkey with it. I have to look less to my left, I guess, if I do it right here. So that's a good thing. How's that? Is that the angle? I suppose. What do we need? Some old... Uh, nothing better in this world than duct tape. For all your construction needs. There we go. How 
was that there? Is that in a good spot? What do you think, Kyle? Is that a little better angle than it was before? I know I can do better still. I don't think that D&D uh, &D blanket's big enough for what I want. I need something that's even wider. Anyway, thanks for the opinion. So this, uh, so the question was, do you actually play D and D, Kyle? I don't even know. Do you play other games besides Magic? We'll just use this time to chat. Hmm. Last eight years or so, D&D, &D, same group, every other week, four to five hours. Nice. What edition do you play? Are you fifth edition people? Last eight years would take you back before fifth edition came out, which was July of 2014. That's when Big John and Floyd and Keith and Kurt and Will and Norman, my good buddy Norm down from... Uh, down in Rockford, all started playing together back then. Uh oh. Yeah. And we played for a few years ourselves. Well, <clears throat> we played other th other things. We we had been running a first edition campaign for a while. 3, 4, and 5 in Pathfinder. Or was it 3E? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Could be 3E, could be 3.5, could be Pathfinder. All of them are slight variations of the same. There's really not a lot, not a whole lot of difference between the three. Um, at least my opinion there. Superficial differences. If you ran a game and told someone it was one or the other, there'd be a few times during the course of the game where it might come up that it was different. But it'd be easy enough to gloss over, I would think. And if you were a DM who rolled stuff behind the scenes rather than... rather than uh, rolling in front of everybody, they might not even notice. Campaign-wise, the question then, since that's kind of the uh, discussion of the day, he said, even though we're, my goodness, what are we, uh, 20 minutes in? <laughs> um, the, the question of the day is, who was the DM? Was it you? If it was or wasn't, uh, what campaign world did they use? Was it uh, adventure modules? Was it a homebrew campaign that they ran uh, of their own design? You do not DM, player. Okay. Who, uh, well, I probably don't know who it was, but a friend of yours DM'd, and they ran a world that they created themselves, homebrew. A homebrew always. Excellent. Were there uh, some specific, uh, exciting... Uh, things about it. We did a really fun 1900s campaign. So you use D&D &D to play a, I don't know, should we call it a post-Victorian? Was it steampunk then? Or magic existed? But did you ever see these uh, Grimtooth's dice? These are pretty cool, huh? There we go. Flying Buffalo, are you familiar? They're pretty neat. Here, you can see all the faces on the back.
one of the things that I had intended to do prior to GaryCon, as we were moving up toward it, I was just in the process of beginning to, let me see if I can get it better. Can that be seen? Yeah, there it is. All right. Anyway, uh, I was in the process of putting together a flying buffalo order. Steve, if you're listening or watching this at some point, my apologies that it never came together because even as I was finishing up, the rumors were starting to fly that it might be canceled and things were getting canceled here and there around the country. And as you know, Gary Khan got canceled and that would have been my main main audience for the order I was going to put together at Lake Geneva Games for Flying Buffalo stuff. You know, there's a lot of good old time, old school stuff on there that would have appealed to that audience. But, um, you know, original Grim Tooth stuff and City this and that. You know, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do much for you in the way of in the way of here we go let's do this get rid of bookmarks bar we will uh, oh I think we can go over here and just full page it so Rick Loomis passed away last year uh, it's a crying shame. He was definitely one of the early stalwarts of of the uh, game industry, as you can see. Flying Buffalo started 1970, and you know nobody, no other company, few other companies did as much for early Dungeons and Dragons either as uh, as Rick and Flying Buffalo did and you'll see when I pop over to some of these certainly uh, dice nowadays and such but if we pop over to some of the pages here they had one of the early uh, tongue-in-cheek slightly slightly takes itself a little less serious uh, competition for Dungeons and Dragons in the form of tunnels and trolls notice that they liberally go back and forth between using an and or an ambersand when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons do not do that in front of Jim Ward because it it's one of his pet peeves if he sees somebody use an and instead of the ambersand for Dungeons and Dragons it will drive him nuts. So, of course, people know Mike Stackpole, Rick Loomis, who we were just talking about, and Ken St. Andre, and they all worked on, well, Ken and Rick. Ken, maybe more than anybody these days that's still around, worked on Tunnels and Trolls. Um, but, you know, I'm telling you stuff that a wiki page would tell you. Here's stuff that I know. Larry worked on city book one these city books are really a great deal you can get them on drive through RPG as as uh, PDFs now let's see here we'll find out what it's going for five bucks down from 15 go grab it now you will not be disappointed 25 city based establishments 75 fully described non-player characters Scenario suggestions. This won their first Origins Award in 1982. Now I can tell you that I really enjoy the flavor. If you want a campaign book that's both useful and fun, then the city books fall right into that quite easily. I'm looking for mine. I can't seem to find them right now. Darn it. I pulled them out. 
sometime not that long ago, and now they're not where I expected to find them. Anyway, I'll have to bring those out <clears throat> maybe the next time. But you've got City Book 1, City Book 2. You've got, of course, all the Grimtooth Trap lines. City Book 3. There's City Book 7. So they've been putting, they put these out for years, on into the 90s even, right? You've got a wealth of material in those if you're looking for stuff to flesh out a campaign world because homebrewing is not that easy for you. You bought a huge pile of D&D 3 books for, oh, that cheap, huh? Okay, 10 or 15 of them. And how many of them have you read, Kyle? I'm putting you on the spot. Did you start reading them already? I mean, you know, talking about during the break here. And I'm calling it a break. I know that's uh, downplaying its seriousness of what's going on in the world right now, but let's be honest. If I got too serious about it, it'd just be another one of those conversations, and we don't need that right now. So, City Book 7 is the top one. I think I've just got like the first three or four. I don't think I ever went as far as Sideshow. Yeah. Anyway, it's just more and more NPCs and locations that can be plopped into a city. And uh, you make some changes to them. Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls might be interesting to get. That's half off right now. If you want to see how another early game system handled RPGing, it's definitely uh, definitely be a fun read. Plenty of pages, twenty bucks for a PDF. Can't go wrong. Maybe it'll prompt you to actually go on to uh, eBay and find yourself a hard co hard copy, or get one direct from the source if they have some in stock. I don't even know if they still they still go to print on that. That's an interesting question. I think they did a Kickstarter not long ago where they re did Tunnels and Trolls. Anyway, this is about campaigns and those city books super duper useful for campaigns. But there's a lot of other stuff on here. Solitaire Adventures Treasure Vault, there's a good campaign source book to have on hand. All right. Uh, let's go over to whoop. Treasure Vault. All right, let's open that up in its own. City of Terrors. Uh-oh, they got the wrong link. Uh, let's do this. I've been Treasure Vault. Treasure Vault, here's the one we want. Collection of 26 unusual items with 38 interlocking personalities in 57 suggested scenario for any role-playing game system. Treasure Vault is one in the Catalyst series of books, a line of Game Master aids for any role-playing system. Each book provides a catalyst for your imagination. But you can see, obviously, they say any role-playing game, but it looks clearly set up for medieval fantasy. Original price, what's that say? Six ninety-five, eight ninety-five, I think. Well, you can get it for five bucks. Six ninety-five was the original price. There it is. There. Um, Full-size preview. Let's have a look inside. <clears throat> Somebody who we should give a shout out to. I don't know if she's listening. Liz Danforth did a lot of early game artwork mm, not for this one though and uh, she got diagnosed as carrying uh, COVID-19 or being infected she I guess is on the back end of that now and recovering she didn't have a super severe case according to posts she made and tweets she made but in any event the hope is that uh, she recovers just fine. Comes out the other side just fine. So it's like a 40-page book, this one. 
and use three of them for your campaign. Oh, okay, Are those D&D &D three books that you used. Um, so you bought that huge pile of books sometime back when you were still playing 3.XE, whatever, some variation thereof. And if you used them as a player, I'm guessing they were like advanced player manual or some sort of a source book, handbook, that uh, three, four years ago, that gave you... Uh, gave you some sort of uh, additional access to feats and weaponry and uh, maybe spells, monster guides. Sure, sure, these are what you got, but which ones did you use as a player? You must have been digging in for... Or were you actually giving some of them to your DM to use as well? Yeah, all that. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, that's good. So, share the wealth, right? You get a hold of some good source books. You don't have to just look through them all yourself. You can hand some over to the DM and let them enjoy uh, let them enjoy some of the fruits of your treasure find. So this is pretty cool. You've got these interesting names of different types of jewelry, weapons and armor, swords of the elements, staff of sigil and a miscellaneous magic items. They look like they have one or two pages a piece, so they're fairly detailed. Um, I have no doubt you're talking about basic format. Appearance, legends, powers, okay. That's good. So, backstory for all of these various things, personalities, all the NPCs connected with the item. Items maker, current owner, past owners, their associates, anybody else. That's pretty interesting. So, you can get, basically, they chase the, trace the, uh, the uh, ownership of the various magic items all the way back to when they were made. And that's pretty cool, because if you're going to have legends about these, these things, then uh, it's nice to uh, know some origins for them, right? Here's often white NPCs. The rating system is necessary. Stats in the city books is described below. Six level ranking system describes how well a particular NPC can fight. In some cases, fighting prowess is given in terms of specific weapon or weapons. Tandon. Tandy Gilliam is good with a bow, average with a short sword, or poor with anything else. Okay. Percentages are given in order to roll randomly. Okay, so we know all sorts of stuff about that. Here's some uh, guidelines for you, too. You've got a percentage die roll possibility if you need to do that. Easily killed or wounded. Run-of-the-mill fighter. No Conan, but not usually killed with a single blow, either. That's interesting. Better than average. Some formal training. Go to tactics and various weapons. Good personnel on your side. Rarely worries about being beaten in combat. On par with epic heroes. Then it talks about magic ability, and it gives you some breakdown for the different levels of that. Combat magic. That's interesting. They separate that out. Communication magic. Clairvoyance magic. Conveyance magic. So teleportation, levitation, things like that. Okay. Well, they... They break a lot of this stuff up very nicely. So you could look at this and with that sort of a breakdown, be able to uh, tailor it to any different system, I would think. So we look at this. Butcher Baker Candlestick Maker. Look inside City Book 1. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, there she is. That's why her name came into my head. She did some of the artwork in this. I wonder if we'll see... No, not enough pages here to get into the artwork. So, I'll have to remember one of these days. Your DM had, like, all the books. He buys them all, I think. Yeah, you know, some people like, uh, like to have a full collection. They're completists, like some of us are, with uh, various things, whether it's magic or 
war games or um, eh, anything, right? Some people like to just have lots of extra fodder for their imagination, even though, they're like you say, he was a home brewer, worked on his own campaign, but, you know, you don't... Uh, Nobody's creative in a, in a vacuum, right? The more you have, the more grist for the mill, the more you'll be able to create because it feeds feeds your muse, right? And that's a good thing. Um, hmm. Just you and me in here today, Kyle. We'll have to drag some other people over here one of these days. Anyway, um, that's a little talk about City Book One. Pretty neat. I'll send you their way. Grab that PDF. This is the fellow I deal with now, is Steve Crompton. He's uh, uh, he's in charge. Uh, Rick is past of Flying Buffalo, and he's handling things over there. And uh, hope everything's going all right. Um, I feel bad for Rick's uh, Rick's widow. Obviously, this is her first year without her husband. Passed last July, August. No, it was earlier than that. Nevertheless, this crisis going on and people being uh, isolated it can't be a good thing for her. If you're a uh, friend of a friend of Flying Buffalo, don't uh, don't let things go. Drop them a drop them a line. Talk to Steve. Let her let her know. Give a call over there. I know this number goes to them, so there it is: 602-945-6917. If you're a fan of Flying Buffalo's work, then give a call over there. Just say you're checking in. Seeing how everybody's doing, making sure uh, everybody's safe and healthy, and not going bonkers, because it's so easy to do. Oh, and by the way, this uh, nuclear war classic game, classic card game. I'm going to take a little moment just to go sideways here, away from RPGs. If you're checking out stuff by Flying Buffalo. It's worth checking out a couple of the others. Skull and Pants. Hey, how's it going? So this is your first time here this week, Skull and Pants. So I will... Whoop, Twitch drawing. There we go. I will add you in, Mike, to uh, this week's drawing since you're here. I already got Kyle. Kcool83 is part of that. All right, that's good. Thanks for stopping by, Mike. Mike, Kyle, Kyle, Mike. Uh, okay, we're having trouble using this website, so I guess we're going to have to uh, give it a miss. So we had a good look. Anyway, what else? There's a lot of stuff uh, campaign-wise that you can grab pretty inexpensively on drive through RPG. Let's see. Oh, here's something you can do. If you're running online games and you need images, there's a uh, whole publisher resource section over on. And as long as you're not just popping these up on and reselling them, if you're using this stock art for your games, say on Roll20 and other things, I do believe that's all fair game. Of course, as always, I would be remiss if I did not mention Dyson Logos. You can pick up his map packs over on Drive-Thru RPG. Some of this stuff that he puts up over here is not just uh, free download stuff. It's it's for pay, but a lot of it is pay what you want. And, uh, you know, throw him a little something. 
OSR character sheets. Here you go. I think these are more for basic, because I think basic D&D &D is what he plays. But there's not much that this that wouldn't work here for any game, right? Hmm. 50 cents, huh? You know what? I'm going to put that off to the side and pick one of those up for myself a little later on. So there's a reminder for me. Then we'll go back here. Um, so again, publisher resources. We'll close that off. We'll go back to... Whoops, not that one. Grand Exalted Sale. This is interesting. Let's do that, and let's do... Whoops. Hmm. What am I looking for? I'm looking for... Well, this is not working. Let's go back. Um... Okay, we got all the publishers, we got the languages, we got the format, genre, publisher resources. Let's add that in. And I'm medieval fantasy. Let's add in fantasy as one of the parameters for campaign resources. And then we'll go to this Grand Exalted Sale. Okay, it's keeping those parameters on. Pick a publisher. No matches found. Okay. All right. So nothing in the Grand Exalted Sale. But Exalted is a specific system, so that's how that goes. And let's see here. All right. Look at some of this artwork here. And a lot of this stuff's pretty inexpensive. Obviously, a big bundle like this from a big publisher, it's a lot of money, 135 But let's do, hmm, let's do an advanced search. Cover this as I said, your warning, RPG stock, Dean Spencer, good stuff. Let's go here. This is weird. All right, this is what we want. Let's see what's free currently for fantasy and for publisher resources. Obviously, you can do Google searches and find all sorts of images, and some of them may actually fit pretty close to what you're trying to do, and that's a that's a good thing if that works out. But if it doesn't, hmm. Giant, um, looking for publisher resources. So, are there any free publisher resources? I don't think I've ever actually searched by this before. I know there's inexpensive stuff. 47 adventure hooks. Bring your PCs together with style. Great NPCs for your campaign. 47 quirks and personality traits. This is Blackstone Entertainment seems to put out a lot of stuff free fantasy stock art that's something worth looking at there's one you know I picked this up from uh, Rick Hershey who does great stuff over at Fat Goblin Games he's uh, he's one of those people who does this full-time makes his money off of this company supports a family so 
he's one of those people I'll steer you toward to help out if you uh, if you aren't hurting if this is not killing you this whole situation for the next couple of months you could do a lot worse than to help out a a very good artist and his company and his family by going over to the Fat Goblin Games drive through RPG site and picking something up whether it's uh, some artwork to use in a in a game and that's easy enough just look for these publisher choice labels a lot of these you know you'll have to put a put a thing in the show notes that says uh, it's from Fat Goblin Games whatever got these cool old school black and white right Classic stuff. Publisher's Choice. Boy, I love that one. I have already got that one myself. I probably have most of these myself. I've bought most of what Rick's put out over the years. He's another one of those um, independent artists that I very much try to support. Him, Dyson Logos, um, there's a couple few others. Uh, Tom Tullis and the work he does with Fat Dragon. Another company that I help out. And these are all companies that help you run your games, right? We've got maps with Dyson. We've got artwork with with uh, Rick. And we've got, uh, you know, accessories. Uh, it used to be paper accessories, fold-up buildings and that sort of thing, cardstock. And now, of course, it's 3D printing for Tom Tullis. And uh, all of these things are enhancements for games. Are they enhancements for games in a, in a virtual game world? Um, yeah. Yeah, there's still, there's still plenty to get out of that. I was looking at the uh, Dwarven Forge Twitch channel just the other day, and they do this top-down camera view on their set up for the game and it's all hand painted Dwarven Forge um, terrain and they've got miniatures in there and they they discuss the game as they run it in terms of where the characters are and <clears throat> they don't necessarily uh, uh, yeah, it's not super focused on tactical which is kind of hard to understand considering they have miniatures and they have terrain set up and they have the miniatures in the terrain and there are five foot squares and all of that but uh, you know they're not slaves to it they they move the stuff around as they need to move the stuff around and you know it's kind of like <laughs> it brings us full circle back in in 74 uh, when we started playing D&D &D and we had played miniatures war games like Chainmail, even though we were sticklers for measuring, you know, if a, if a figure could go eight inches on the terrain, in the type of terrain you were, you were in, you would measure it out front to front or back to back. You didn't, uh, didn't cheat yourself an extra half an inch. Um... But when we started playing D&D, &D, even though we did keep miniatures on the table and stuff, we were more loose about it. We had to, we had them out there to make sure that we were designating a marching order. Um, we enjoyed miniature figures anyway and, and painting them. <laughs> Not that we were all that good at it. My buddy Jerry was, I think. Uh, a few other people. Tim. Tim Lewis, who I played with back then, I think, uh, painted some miniatures. Anyway, um, we kept them out there to keep track of marching order, and then for relative positions, even if we didn't have a grid laid out. If uh, one guy was over here, one guy was over there, and a monster was over here, and you wanted to show the angles you were trying to get on him, and how 
relatively close you were. I'm twice as close as this guy is to this thing. Then you'd uh, move the minifigures around and stuff. But you weren't measuring out inches, and, and it wasn't like a war game in that respect. So Accessories can be used online in this age with you know video and cameras and all that stuff. Certainly artwork can be used even in ga even in, uh, settings like Roll20. Um, I'm currently taking some of the maps from Dyson Logos and uh, making some adjustments to them so I can use them in a Roll20 game. Uh, so I can lay them out in... Uh, use uh, i got a tavern map that I have set up. I wonder if I've got that up and running and could show it to you. Let's see. Uh, games. My games. I'm going to launch this one. So I took... Uh, my friend Nancy Hutchin was sitting in a chat with me the other day. And... I was working on my Roll20 campaign, and she works on hers, too, and she was doing the same thing. So I took a Dyson Logos map and put it in on the map background layer, right? So that's actually where it is. I think you have to hold down the Alt key while you're adjusting the size of it to avoid it snapping to the grid. So I had to do that. Nevertheless, uh, where are we? I'll go back to the objects layer. And then on the GM's layer, I just grab some of the characters from their portfolio of tokens. Uh, I bucked up for a pro for one month because I wanted to see all the bells and whistles and figure out whether I actually needed a full full system. Anyway. I renamed it Hutchins Hideaway because Nancy was in the thing. But, you know, I've got uh, Dyson's uh, credit right there with the map. So if anybody sees this, he's getting he's getting his due, and that's uh, part of the rule. On the GM level, I have some information. I can actually only see this. All right. So there's a secret trap door going down underneath there. This is a stairway going down, obviously. Um, but I'd rather have the secret door there. I've got it set up so that you can go down from there. And this is a generic map off of their site into this sort of a place where there's some lizard folk. Right down below, they have their god there. Below this, there's a secret trap door under the fire pit, and that takes us to a sewer fight level where there are giant frogs, and that drops you right down there. They feed their giant frogs with drunks that they collect from the bar above, and they use their giant frogs as a food source for them. So there's kind of this little uh, little biome of lizardmen, frogs, and a bar up above. It's just a simple little adventure, and it'll start here in Hutchins Hideaway. And once you go to that GM's overlay level, once they start entering the bar, you can introduce the characters by moving them from the GM layer up to the token layer saying who they are. Oops, got to switch over there to saying who they are, moving them around, letting them talk to the player characters. As the player characters explore, they can get more information on them. Drop it back to the GM layer. Okay, anyway, uh, we're just about out of time here. We're at an hour anyway, and I don't want to run longer than that. Mike, Kyle, thank you both for stopping by in the chat. Um, for a future Wednesday campaign discussions, let's see if we can get some more people in here. I'll talk to some people in advance about popping in 
I just wanted to do the first one on my own so I could ramble for a while, which obviously I can do for hours if I want to. So thank goodness I noticed the clock. Anywho, it's enough to say that I appreciate anybody who's watching this after it is recorded and done. Thanks for checking out my very fun new technical difficulties screen. Put this up for the closing credits. And it is enough to say thank you again. Take care of yourself. Be safe. Be healthy. And we'll talk soon.